Hydraulic fracturing, or fracking, is a highly misunderstood process that breaks up the rock so oil and gas can flow out of a reservoir. It is the poster child of the anti-oil and gas movement and has been banned in a handful of misguided states and municipalities. During the debate to ban fracking in New York, one state senator said, Hydraulic fracturing is a new process by which a slurry of toxic chemicals are pumped into horizontal wells. It is a threat to our water supplies and should be banned statewide. Given such negative rhetoric, it is understandable why the public fears the practice. This short video explains how and why we frack wells and presents the proof that fracking isn't ruining our drinking water. So what is a frack and why do we need to do it? Oil and gas is found in microscopic pore spaces in sedimentary rock. Most sandstones and all shales have very low permeability, which is a measure of how easy or difficult it is for fluid to flow through rock. Virtually all of the wells being drilled in the U.S. require fracking to break the rock up so it will produce in commercial rates. During the fracking process, water and sand are pumped into a well at pressures that are high enough to crack the rock. Once the pressure is released, the sand stays in the cracks to hold the fracture open while the frac fluid and ultimately oil and gas is produced back. The permeability in the fracture is many thousands of times the formation permeability. So the frack becomes a superhighway by which oil and gas are able to get to the wellbore. Historically, conventional reservoirs were developed with multiple vertical wells. Each well was fracked, which broke up the rock a few hundred feet around a well, allowing each well to drain a small area. Therefore, it took many, many wells to effectively drain a large reservoir. This approach has been used since 1960, and since that time, over a million wells have been fracked to provide us the oil and gas we need to run our lives. We have also been drilling horizontal wells for over 60 years, but early on it was only in select situations. If you drill vertically through a 100 foot thick sandstone, then you can only complete 100 foot thick interval. But if you drill horizontally 10,000 feet in that same sandstone, you have increased by 100 times your connection to the formation. The problem was that if you fracked a 10,000 foot horizontal in a single frack, it would find the weakest place in the rock and all the frack would go there so it wouldn't effectively break up the rock along the entire wellbore. Therefore, horizontal wells were primarily drilled in high permeability formations that didn't need to be fracked. In the early 2000s, all that changed when Mitchell Energy, working in the Barnett Shale near Fort Worth, Texas, came up with the tools to isolate the wellbore between multiple frack treatments. The process is simple and repetitive. After the horizontal section is drilled, seal pipe, called casing, is run and cemented in the hole to isolate the formation along the wellboard. Perforating guns that blow holes in the pipe are then run to the end of the well, and an approximate 200-foot section of the well is perforated. That section is then fracked, which breaks up the rock in that area out to a couple hundred feet from the well. A plug is then run and set in the hole to isolate that fracked interval, and the next 200 feet is perforated and fracked. That process has repeated as many as 60 times along a two-mile lateral, with each frack interval basically replacing a vertical well. When the process is done, the plugs are drilled out, allowing the frack fluid and then the trapped oil and gas to flow into the wellbore and to the surface. In summary, the old way to develop a large reservoir was with many, many vertical wells, each with their own surface location. Now we are able to develop the reservoir with far fewer wells, and since they are being drilled directionally, we can co-locate those wells on the same surface well pad. In the end, this new process that has the public all up in arms is the optimization of two very old processes that significantly reduces the impact on the land and the environment. So how do we know that fracks aren't getting into groundwater? Though it's hard to prove a negative, here's the evidence, and it's pretty solid. Number one, multiple strings of casing are cemented in the hole across the shallow freshwater sands. Thus, the wellbore is completely isolated from these sands, and neither the frac fluid or the produced fluids ever come in contact with the shallow freshwater via the wellbore. Number two, the fractures only reach out from the wellbore a few hundred feet in both directions. We simply aren't pumping enough fluid volume for a fracture to grow through more than a mile of rock to the surface. Third, a frack that cracks the rock is a minor but measurable seismic event. At minus two on the Richter scale, they cannot be felt at the surface. However, in an effort to understand and optimize our fracks, we use highly sensitive seismometers to measure how far and where a frack grows. The attached graph shows the results of thousands of fracks in the Barnett Shale, none of which came anywhere close to groundwater. 
On a side note, there is concern that fracking causes earthquakes, which is not the case, as a frack is a short-term event that cannot be felt at the surface. However, earthquakes have been connected with the long-term disposal of wastewater in seismically active areas. Because the sandstones were initially deposited in the ocean, there is always some ancient seawater produced with the oil and gas. Because that water is salty, it is typically disposed of by re-injecting into a deeper formation. The increase in small earthquakes in Oklahoma were associated with the increase in the disposal of water in a seismically active fault zone. The regulators are now limiting injection volumes in that region, and the number of earthquakes have decreased dramatically. Fourth, there is no toxic slurry, as implied by the senator, because the fluids being pumped are 99.5% water and sand. The balance is made up of chemicals, all of them found in one form or another in your house, that primarily inhibit corrosion, protect the formation, and thicken the fluid so it will carry sand into the formation. The primary chemical is muriatic acid that, just like it does in a swimming pool, lowers the pH so that the other chemicals work properly. And just like pool water, while you wouldn't want to drink frack water, it wouldn't hurt you if you did. But not to worry, because as the data shows, it is not getting into your drinking water anyway. Fifth, another criticism of fracking is the amount of water it requires. A 60-stage, 2-mile lateral can use up to 15 million gallons of water to frack. That sounds like a lot, but it needs to be put in perspective to the amount of good that results from that use. A million barrel well will provide the equivalent energy needed for 8,000 homes for 20 years. Those same homes will use 6 billion gallons of water over 20 years. So in effect, they gave up less than one half of 1% of their water use to provide them the energy they need. Another way to look at it is that 15 million gallons will water a golf course for 20 days. So. 20 years for 8,000 homes, or 20 days for 100 golfers a day. Arguably, it is a reasonable use of water, especially when the industry is moving towards recycling much of the frack water for reuse. So in the end, fracking doesn't get into groundwater and cause death, cancer, gun disease, or hangnails. Don't believe me, believe the EPA and President Obama. In 2015, after years of study, the EPA concluded that while there are above and below ground mechanisms by which fracking has the potential to impact drinking water, they did not find evidence of any widespread systemic impacts on our water. There were a few instances where surface waters got contaminated, but the number of cases was small compared to the number of fracked wells. As a side note, none of those instances were due to the fracking process itself, but were due to operator air at the surface, and when they happened, they got cleaned up. In closing, let's examine the misinformation contained in the Senator's statement. Hydraulic fracturing is not a new process, but has been conducted on almost every well drilled in the U.S. for the last 60 years. Frack fluid is not a slurry of toxic chemicals, but is mainly water and sand. And finally, the evidence clearly shows that the fracking process itself is not a threat to water supplies anywhere, anytime. Yes, oil and gas development has some impact on the environment. But the reality is, there is no zero impact energy source. And although there are impacts, ironically, fracking is not one of them. Industry will tell you that if fracking is banned in the U.S., we will just import the energy, which will increase the cost of the consumer, eliminate millions of jobs, increase our trade deficit and national debt, and erode our national security as we become reliant on others for our energy. Well, those are all true. The real reason not to ban fracking is because it isn't a threat to our water supplies. In over a million wells fracked over 60 years, there has never been a documented case of the fracture itself growing into groundwater. So at the end of the day, don't fear the frack. The end of this video, but not of fracking, I hope. Thank you for watching this video. If you felt the message is important, please share it with your family and friends. Please keep your eye out for other videos covering climate change and the challenges we face as we transition to a lower carbon energy portfolio.